Welcome to Utopian Horizons. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of Utopian Horizons, a podcast about utopias real and imaginary. This episode is about Time Out of Joint, a novel by Philip K. Dick, and this is the first of a kind of ongoing mini-series I'm going to be doing within Utopian Horizons where I work my way through Philip K. Dick's bibliography. To clarify, that doesn't mean that I'm just going to be doing Philip K. Dick episodes from now on until I'm done with that. I'm still going to be doing the normal interview format episodes, but it will just mean that every now and again these will be they'll be interspersed with these um, Philip K. Dick ones. Um, obviously, this is a bit of an experiment as well with me doing a solo episode for the first time, so... It'd be great if you could let me know what you think of it and if I should keep going with this and uh, finish the whole Philip K. Dick canon. So this will probably be shorter than normal episodes. I don't know. I haven't done it yet. We'll see how it goes. But also with being able to do these solo episodes, it will hopefully mean that I can get episodes out more regularly by like putting these in when I'm in sort of in between interviews and stuff with the with the normal episodes. So yeah. As this is the first one I'm doing on Philip K. Dick, uh, it might be worth introducing him. You're probably aware of him to some degree, but anyway, so he was born in 1928, died in 1982, and he was a science fiction writer working from sort of the late 50s until his death. He was a very prolific writer. He wrote between 40 and 50 novels, some of which were published posthumously, and over 100 short stories. So Philip K. Dick is someone who's been called the Shakespeare of science fiction by Frederick Jameson. He's also someone who you can find being criticised for having like plot holes and Fred, Fred's left uh, hanging loose, what you basically term as like criticism of technical execution, I suppose. Uh, I think it's interesting that these two kind of diametrically opposed conceptions of what Philip K. Dick is exist. It's worth remembering that this is a writer producing novels at an exceptionally fast rate, sometimes fueled by amphetamines, usually struggling in poverty. And if you do detect any sloppiness in his work, that perhaps accounts for that. But in any case, this is this is a genre writer writing in what's considered a low cultural form, but also dealing with kind of high cultural ideas. He's dealing with uh, very philosophical uh, ideas in a complex and intelligent way. So I think Philip K. Dick is interesting partly because he's all of these things. He's uh, low culture, high culture. He is Shakespeare of science fiction. He's genre hack. That might be a bit too far, but you get what I mean. He's he's interesting because he's he crosses these boundaries. I think what really makes Dick an exceptional writer, what really makes him interesting, is the strength of his ideas. And I think that's, well, that hopefully that's something that's going to come out as we work our way through his bibliography. I've got this quote about Philip K. Dick from Brian Aldiss, a British science fiction writer that appeared in a BBC documentary in 1994 that I wanted to read out. Uh, and he said, It's interesting that now, when both Heinlein and Dick have been dead for a decade, Isaac Asimov is dead. It's Heinlein and Asimov that seem like dinosaurs, and Philip K. Dick, who seems immensely contemporary. Now, I don't want to kind of explain or work out like why Philip K. Dick might feel more contemporary than other science fiction writers, but I just thought that was interesting. And I think it is true that Philip K. Dick seems unusually contemporary compared to some other science fiction writers. I just thought that might be worth putting out there as we go through to try and think about why that might be. Um, it also might explain why Hollywood keeps returning to mine the works of a, a relatively obscure and bizarre in many ways uh, writer you'll see that as we get to later novels blade runner is the most famous philip k dick adaptation there's also total recall minority report the adjustment bureau and lots lots more so i think there's something in that that people keep returning to philip k dick there's something there that feels contemporary and that's something i uh, hope we can think about as we go through so time out of joint there will be spoilers, by the way, so if that bothers you, then read, you know, read the book beforehand, come back later. Um, Time Out of Joint, published in 1959, set at the time it was published, so late 50s. It's set in a stereotypical 1950s small town. It tells the story of Ragul Gum, who lives with his sister Margot and her husband Vic. 
He makes his living by entering a newspaper contest, which he enters every day. It's called Where Will the Little Green Man Be Next Contest. There's like a thousand squares or something, and he has to guess where the little green man will be next. In his view, this is not guessing. He has a talent to see the patterns, and he sits there every day surrounded by graphs and charts that he's he's plotted, um, all these papers stacked up. He sits there from the morning until the end of the day, uh, like a job, drinking warm beer and trying to work out his entry for the contest. And he's been winning this contest every day for two years. Now, I'll get to the details of the story, but essentially, Ragul and a couple of people around him increasingly start to feel like there's something wrong with the world, and they gradually start to collect clues that suggest that it's in some way fake. And the story revolves around them trying to work out uh, what that might mean and what's going on. And you end up with a kind of Truman Show revelation. I'd be very surprised if whoever came up with the idea for the Truman Show hadn't read this novel. Um... Yeah, Truman Star Revelation, where he realises that the world he lives in is completely artificial. It's been constructed around him and the year is actually 1996 or whatever the year is, something like that. Now, first thing I want to talk about is the vacuousness, the fakeness of this world. I think what's particularly interesting about it is that it already feels fake before you get to the reveal. So before you start getting these clues about the world's true nature, there's already a sense that it's fake. I think the reason for that is because Dick is painting this as a vacuous consumer society that's like obsessed with status. This is a reality that's built out of products and signs. And the effect of that is that it already feels fake. Now, remember the idea of like 1950 suburbs as being like a fake idealized time that hides something more sinister is something that has been done a lot since to the point that it's kind of a cliche perhaps, but Dick was writing this at the time. So I think what he's doing is, is quite clever and original. He's, We may now have this idea of the 1950s as, some, as somehow being like this fake construction, but Philip K. Dick is painting his current reality as that. He's doing this at the time, so that, that makes it a bit different. So I want to give a couple of examples of, of the kind of picture he's painting and how he's doing this. So uh, Vic, early on, talks about how he joined the book club with his wife when he moved into a neighbourhood that set great stock in such things. He talks about having Toynbee's history. He says he hasn't finished it yet, but he recognised that it was a major literary and historical work worth having in his library. So the point here, first of all, he's joined the book club because of the status it gives him, not because he's interested in the books or he wants to do it. And in, in this book he specifically talks about, the value isn't in the book itself or what he might get out of reading it. The value is in his status and the fact that he has it in his library. We've got another example here, Margot, Ragul's sister. Early on she's in her car and she's thinking about her car almost in the terms of like an advertisement of the kind of way it would be advertised or, or sold. And she's she's thinking about the benefits of different cars. She sees a Tucker sedan drive past. I've got no idea if that's a real car. I don't know anything about cars. Anyway, she says, the Tucker was as radical a car as the VW and at the same time, wonderfully styled. But of course, it was too large to be practical. And she's thinking about trading in the car next year. She's thinking trade-ins are high on VWs. We can get back our equity. So she's completely obsessed with like the, the status that her car gives her, the pluses and minuses, like the practicalities of, of the value and how much you can trade it in for, what you can get back. So that gives you a kind of idea of the way the people in this world are thinking. Then you have their neighbours, the Blacks. Now they come over and they, they complain about how the blacks are always like foisting the latest fads on them. They express annoyance that they're affecting a contempt for TV as an attempt to move up to the next rung on the social ladder. So again, consumerism, status, like products, this is what everyone's completely obsessed with. Um, there's one more quote I want to pick out uh, near the end of the book. This is when it's been revealed that the town is fake and this is kind of a memory of childhood but also like a regression to fantasy. But um, anyway, this is Ragul as a child watching his parents go into a drugstore. And it says, Trading on electric razors, he thought, as he watched his mother and father go off toward the drug department of Ernie's shopping centre. 7 50 for your old razor, regardless of make. No one less preoccupation, the pleasure of buying. Above his head, the shiny signs, colours of shifting ads, the brightness, the splendour. He wondered about the parking lot among the long pastel cars, gazing up at the signs, reading the words in the window displays. Shilling drip coffee, 69 cents a pounds. Gosh, he thought, what a buy. His eyes took in the sight of merchandise, cars, people, counters. He thought, 
What a lot to look at. What a lot to examine. A fair, practically. So you can see this fantasy that he's in is a fantasy completely built on consumer logic. The, the town's literally fake in terms of the story, but Dick's also writing about the fakeness of contemporary consumer society. This is the kind of world you get when you're affected by the logic of advertising and marketing and consumer items as signs of status become your obsession. You get this fantasy that is laid out in its most bare terms in, in this uh, paragraph, I think. It's like The signs, um, the counters, the products. This is what makes up reality. Now, on one level, this is obviously a critique of consumerism and advertising and so on, but I don't think it's as simple as like consumerism as is bad. I think what Philip K. Dick is getting at here is that consumer society um, has a deeper kind of subjective effect. It starts to impact on the way you experience reality. When consumerism so completely envelops your world, um, your social relations, the way you interact with other people, your view of yourself and your own status then it actually becomes reality in a sense and that means reality starts to lose its substance because it's a complete surface fake veneer so i think it, the novel's really effective in that aspect i think that's perhaps one of the best things about it the way it, it thinks of consumer society and the way it um, draws the parallels between like this literal fakeness and the metaphor it's using to get something deeper now as we go through Dick's bibliography this is something we I think we're going to return to he's kind of mapping a phenomenon of the way that changing society partly about consumerism but I think also uh, media like new media you've got tv and stuff coming in is um, affecting reality and I think he's trying to map the way that reality is changing so that's something we'll return to in future books but I think he's trying to do something in fiction which other people are also doing in theory at the time so around this sort of time you have people like Guy Dubois writing the society of the spectacle where he's talking also about the impacts of a media society a consumer society where uh, everything's about appearances signs representation this is a quote i've pulled out of the wikipedia page i'm not going to pretend i've gone in and read the society of the spectacle this is the the first quote was on there but i thought it was interesting because it says all that was once directly lived has become mere representation now if you've read time out of joint you'll see that that quote certainly resonates with some of the things that happens within this book so th there are those parallels there and i think that's uh interesting that people are trying to come to terms with this new um this new world and, and what that means for the way we experience it we've also got people like bolger as well writing a uh, system of objects uh, the consumer society and again it's about how this new world how consumerism um, how media is affecting our relationships with reality and how reality is kind of flattening out losing its depth how it's affecting how we interact with other people it's affecting our real relations now, i could go on more about that and get into like Baudrillard's simulacra and simulation Jameson talking about postmodernism but one I don't want to get too pretentious and flighty but also I think that's something that could perhaps return to in more detail in later dick books where it becomes more relevant um, hopefully that's not too boring me going on about theory and stuff and hopefully I've explained it properly uh, let me know if I haven't now I want to talk a bit about paranoia both in terms of this novel, Time I've Joined, where it's obviously very important, but also in Dick's work in general, paranoia permeates pretty much everything he does. So where does that come from? Uh, Philip K. Dick was certainly a paranoid person. He suffered from mental health issues, which we will talk about uh, as we go through his book, certainly when we get to Vallis. It's difficult to know which stories about Dick are true. Thomas M. Dish, a uh, science fiction writer, I think it was him that called Dick a great self mythologizer. So the stories that float around about him may or may not be true. But anyway, to give you an idea of the kind of person that Dick was and the, the way that paranoia affected his life, this is somebody who wrote to the FBI repeatedly requesting to see his file because he's convinced that they would be monitoring him and have a file on him. Apparently, he eventually received the file and it consisted entirely of the letters he had been sending to them asking to see the file. He also, by the way, reported Thomas M. Ditch to the FBI after reading Camp Concentration, a Thomas M. Ditch novel, saying that it had like secret anti-American messages in it or something. So I'm not sure to what extent he believed that, to what extent he was jealous, maybe a bit of both. Obviously, that was a rather <laughs> nasty thing to do, but um, Thomas... Ditch has forgiven him, I guess 
perhaps because he knew that he was a kind of troubled guy. He was involved actually in creating the, the Philip K. Dick Award, so he certainly hasn't held it against him. So yeah, Dick was a troubled man, so I don't know, maybe we should give him a break like Thomas did. Uh, one of my favourite Philip K. Dick stories, which illustrates his kind of paranoia, but also I think the way that he embraced his paranoia and played with it to tell stories, is when his house was broken into, his safe was broken into, and some papers were stolen. Now, he came up with all kinds of different theories and, and tales of what he thought had happened. So he proposed that the government had been investigating him and they'd broken in to get his papers and find out stuff about him. I think there was something about, like, he thought maybe somebody had told some drug gang in the area, like, a lie about him, or they were angry about him and they'd done it to send a message to him or something like that. He probably had other ones about Freemasons or something, I don't know. But my favourite theory of his that he came up with is one which I think he proposed in a Rolling Stone interview, which is that the robbery had been committed by him himself and he didn't remember doing it for some reason. So that, so yeah, Philip K. Dick was a paranoid man. But we're not just dealing with a man who's mapping his pathology onto his books here, I don't think. Because it's not just that Dick is writing a lot about paranoia, it's that his paranoia somehow resonates with us. Like, if it was just a paranoid guy, like, writing a load of bizarre stuff, it wouldn't be interesting, right? But it is interesting. So why is that? Why does it resonate with people? I've been trying to think about this. I think the reason for that is because he's very good at... He's very good at writing about and representing paranoia, first of all, but he's also good at tying it into the sense that the world is against us in some way. Um, and what I mean by that... I'm not suggesting that he's doing this consciously, by the way, but I think think this is why it works. He uses paranoia as a device to capture the kind of indifferent, diffuse nature of oppression that you get in the modern world. Modern governments, capitalism, corporate culture, whatever. So it's not necessarily in the in the modern world that the government or someone like that is really directly out to get you uh, in that classic like, paranoid way, like someone is out to get you. But the tools of ideology are diffuse. Like consumer society, or like advertising, it's not like planned by a secret cabal of people in a hidden bunker somewhere to deaden people's political conscience. But it does have that effect and it is useful for, for power. So society, government, capitalism, whatever, might not be against you specifically, but it is still against you. It is oppressing you in an indirect way. So I'm trying to think of examples to explain what I mean so the mainstream media for example the mainstream media tends towards defending power it tends towards defending the establishment corporate interests and so on but it does so in a complex way it's not that someone's directly telling the media what to say though that does still happen uh, in some places and in some forms it's more complex than that it's that for a start, the certain pe- the type of people that tend to come into the mainstream media come from a certain class of people, which means they already share certain ideas and interests with um, certain groups of people, or they tend to anyway. Once they get into the media, then they start to move in certain circles, and they're going to tend to sympathise with the people that they associate with and take on their ideas, and those ideas will then be pushed back into the media. So ideology in modern society is not something enforced in the old way of like very obvious propaganda and like we'll jail you if you disagree with us we'll kill you ideology is more effective today because people take it on themselves and replicate it like pretty much everyone today accepts the capitalist society we have as some kind of reality like as a default reality as a natural way of doing things so it's not like enforced on you it's something that's replicated throughout society i hope that i hope i'm explaining that properly so what i'm getting at is that power is very diffuse so Dick's use of paranoia captures something about that, the way that power is against you in a kind of vague, unknowable way. Like, it's not clear how you're being oppressed. There's no one specifically who's doing it, but it's still happening. I think that's why his use of power resonates. I'm not sure that he does that so well in this book as he does in other works, but I think there is an element of going that going on in Time Out of Joint. I hope I've explained that properly. Again, if I haven't, I'm not sure I've done a good job, then let me know and I'll try to clarify that. But hopefully I've got across what I'm trying to get out there. Now, before we go on to talking about the specific ways that reality begins to break down or is uncovered in this book, 
I think it's something we've got to talk about first because it precedes one of the important scenes related to that is a kind of what I suppose is fair to describe as a sexual assault. Like this weird creepy bit between Ragul and Bill Black's wife whose name has escaped me. So this is a good place to talk about women in the book and Dick's general misogyny. You may have noticed if you've read it that as well as this creepy bit that I'm talking about, women are not portrayed favourably. Uh, in this book so the the character i'm talking about whose name i've forgotten is basically an idiot she's a, a kind of child um i feel like this is an archetype which we're going to encounter again in philip k dick's novels uh, but i do have a very bad memory i may be wrong on that but i feel like this is someone i've i've seen uh, come up again and again uh, it'll be interesting to see as we go through if we can find some more positive and complex uh, depictions of female characters but i wouldn't necessarily hold your breath on that so she's completely oblivious to what's happening and even as her husband, Bill Black, who is part of this conspiracy and is trying to maintain it, there's a part where he almost drops the charade completely in front of that and she still can't see it. But she's completely obsessed with like trivial events and like affairs and gossip, which I think is kind of indicative of, of Dick's view of women in some way. There's also Margot, who is on the cusp of revelation at the same time as Ragul and Vic. But whereas they get over the edge, she never does. Like, she can never quite make the connection. She can never quite bring herself out of this, like, the mundanity of everyday life and this consumer world that she's uh, situated herself in. So you might have been thinking, oh, I'll give Dick the benefit of the doubt. Maybe that's just the way those women are in this book, these particular characters. No, that's something that's going to come up <laughs> again and again, I think. But I think that's something I'll perhaps touch on in more detail when we get to the Clans of the Alpha Moon, which I've rem if I've remembered it correctly, has a particularly spiteful depiction of a female character, which is almost funny in like how over the top it is and how obviously this is about somebody that Dick's angry with and not about the story in any way but anyway that's that's for another day so how does the world that is presented in this book start to be uncovered and fake how does reality start to break down the first instance we get of this is when vic goes into a bathroom and he can't find the light cord like he reaches for it instinctively it's not there he's flashing around for it he bangs his head and then he realizes that realizes that they have a switch there is no light cord and what he's worried about is that he was searching for this this cord reflexively this wasn't he was looking for randomly he instinctively knew there was a cord in there in a specific place and he was naturally grabbing for it and he's very bothered by this more than more than you might think he says what's wrong what did i stumble on in there where have i been that i don't remember there's another character who has a, a similar experience um, she talks about trying to step up an extra step that wasn't there so we've all done that i think like you go up a set of stairs or down a set of stairs you expect there to be an extra step and there's not and then you have like this kind of weird feeling this is a very philip k thick thing to do like take something that we've all experienced where our internal reality conflicts with external reality in some way that most of us would just shrug off but he refuses to let it be and he makes it a subject for philosophical speculation which is um, what he does here the most striking example of reality breaking down is when Ragul is waiting in a queue for a drink stand. He gets to the end of the queue and he asks for a beer. The guy at the counter doesn't move. All sound stops. The money that he put on the counter falls through it and he sees the counter collapse into molecules and go out of existence along with the guy that was stood behind it. And in its place, there's just a slip of paper that says soft drink stand. And he puts it in the box with six other pieces of paper. So we know this has happened before. And this is what I was talking about with the Dubois quite earlier. So we've been talking about reality losing its substance. That's literally what we get here. Like reality literally disappears and you've just got the pure sign underneath. There's, there's nothing there. And this is one of Dick's, if not his main preoccupation, like shifting realities, the degree to which you can trust reality. So what's going on here? Partly, this is obviously a metaphor for what we've already talked about, like fakeness of consumer society, how that impacts your um, perception and the way you interact with reality. But it's also a point for him to talk about how you square the gap between subjective reality and objective reality that you can never know. Like how do you know what's real? This is a fundamental question for Dick and I think also a great source of anxiety for him. And again, I think this connects with something more general going on at the time with like proliferation of media we're at a time where reality starts to be mediated by by these new medias in ways that it never has before and i think that what 
uh, makes this this Burke and Dick's work this book work is that he's tapping into that anxiety, this sense that reality is 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 somehow losing something. There's another moment which is like a, a great Dickian inversion where Vargo has been trying to escape from the fake world he's been placed in, and Bill Black, who's well, as I said, working for the powers that be, trying to maintain this illusion, and Monitor Vargo knows that he's trying to escape, and he he worries about this. He says everything could be handled, but what if Vargo was becoming sane again? And that's a classic Dick kind of thing. Like this idea, what if when you start to experience things that don't fit with reality, what if that's not you going insane? How do you know you're not insane at the moment? And these things that are coming in that are conflicting with your reality actually represent the real world. And in a sense, this is a concern of Raghu throughout the novel. He's constantly speculating on whether he's insane he's consistently worrying about these conflicting experiences um he he starts to get more and more evidence for what's going on but he's still he's pivoting between being confident that he's uncovering something and the idea that he's delusional that he's well aware that this idea that he's at the center of the universe and he's the most important person and he's uh, doing something valuable and for some people for some reason people want to watch him is a classic delusional symptom Again, I think this is what works with Dick's paranoia, as well as being a very paranoid man. I think he was very self-aware of his own paranoia uh, and what that meant. But again, this is a method for Dick to explore how we come to terms with the fact that our perception is subjective and we never know for certain what's real. Now, in this novel, that's somewhat resolved, but there is no way for Rago to know before and it's terrifying and that's one of the things that Dick is really concerned with. So at the end of the novel we find out that Rago is not delusional, he escapes, he finds out it's 1996, he's been in a complete fake world built around him and there's a war between the moon and the earth. This little green man contest he's been doing is actually a means of predicting where the next bomb that the moon is firing is going to land and he'd been doing this prior to being in this fake world but he had a breakdown regressed into this uh, fancy world and the powers that be built the world around him to kind of exploit that and keep him going doing his job i don't think it's really worth going to this going into detail in this end section of novel because i think it's the weakest part of the book becomes this kind of thing about like progress versus isolationism the human drive to explore but i don't think it's the most interesting part of the book i think it's actually a kind of unsatisfying conclusion and it's unsatisfying because it collapses those conflicting perceptions of what's real and paranoia your uncertainty about what's real into certainty and it and it does so with like a boring and unoriginal logical sci-fi explanation that doesn't really lead anywhere interesting now even having said that i'm not sure how good a job this book does in balancing your uncertainty as a reader as to whether raga was losing his mind or not now part of the problem with this is i haven't read this book for a long time I can't remember how I responded the first time and I knew what the ending was uh, this time around. So I always felt like the book was in favour of the rational explanation. But I perhaps that's because I already knew that. So I'd be really interested to hear from people who are listening to this and have read it, where, what you felt like reading it. Like, were you unsure about about what was going on because I think that is where the book was at its best. Regardless, I think Dick gets far better at playing with reality and your perspective on what's happening as he goes on. He's very good at pulling the rug out from under you. And I think if he had written this book later in his career, I don't think he'd have ended like this. I think he would have left you in a far greater state of uncertainty. Now, I think the the final thing I want to talk about, there is a sense in which that uncertainty is still there in that there's a lot of stuff that's not explained so the end of the book doesn't actually account for the way that reality was disintegrating. So the fact that a drink stand disappeared and there was just a note there, there's more sections like that. Um, there's a bit where Vic's on a bus and he like squints his eyes and the bus fades away and he talks about like these these uh, heads lolling in motion with the bus, these hollow men on a hollow bus. Again, the kind of empty, shallow world thing there is is obvious for all to see. But the logical explanation that the book gives you at the end doesn't account for this. Now, you could be kind and say that he's doing precisely what I suggested in uh, he's trying to uh, create this uncertainty in, in what's real and what's not. But it feels more to me like he's actually just forgot about it. And this is a plot thread that uh, where he had an idea, but he didn't really uh, think it through and develop it and get get and finish the thought that he had. 
I think this is the product of a guy who's churning out work incredibly fast and it's just something that he never got around to tying up and again later in his career I think he would have made more of this and I think it would have been more of a focus on the book of the book sorry so that's time out of joint I've kind of used this book to talk about uh, Philip K. Dick and his kind of themes that we'll be returning to as much as I have the book. So I hope I have a. I hope I've talked enough about the book and haven't focused on the other stuff too much. But certainly these are things we're going to be returning to. So I thought it was worth trying to lay them out as as much as possible. The next Philip K. Dick episode will be on the Man in the High Castle, probably his best known novel, along with Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. Again, as I said before, when I say the next episode, I don't literally mean the next episode. The next episode will be a normal interview one or whatever. But when I get to the next Philip K. Dick one, it will be The Man in the High Castle. So if you want to read it, then hopefully you'll have time to do that. Uh, please let me know what you thought of this episode. If nobody likes me doing these solo ones, if people didn't find this interesting, then, you know, I don't need to keep doing them. Um, so let me know what you think. Was it too long? Was it too short? Did I go into too much detail? Did I explain things properly? It would be really great to know so that I can uh, take that on board. If you have got any questions or comments about Time Out of Joint, don't feel that it's not worth sending them, sending them to me now the episode's already done. By all means, send them to me. Um, when I get to doing the next Philip K. Dick episode, I'll address them then. Uh, that's not a problem. If you've got any uh, comments or, or questions on The Man in the High Castle, also send them to me um, before recording if you can, and those are some, that's something that I can then talk about during the episode. You can send those to me at utopianhorizonspod at gmail.com and Twitter at utopianhorizons or facebook.com slash utopianhorizons. Uh, as always, if you've enjoyed this episode, don't for forget to subscribe. Uh, if you could please give me a rating review on iTunes, that would be massively appreciated. I've also got a Patreon if anyone feels compelled to help support the podcast financially and help it keep going, which you can find at patreon.com slash utopianhorizons. Anyway, that's the end of this episode. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Okay.